so the programs, you know, have been attracting, you know, that kind of talent that Moza has not been attracting before. A decade of, you know, high net worth individuals coming to Malta. Offering the, the top one percent of, of, of segment of what they what they do and who they are, right, in the sectors they operate. So it's a really privileged segment of the world population. The Global Passport Investor is your go-to podcast. Welcome to the latest episode of the Global Passport Investor. I'm your host, Eric Major, an investment migration veteran with over three decades in the game. I'm also the founder and executive chairman of the Latitude Group, where our clients expect the world and we deliver it. So this is the latest in a series of things where we talk about citizenship by investment, residency by investment, and all things investment migration. If you're watching this on YouTube, please leave us your questions in the comments section below. And for those listening to the podcast, email your queries to questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. So today, we are talking to you about Malta, the country that, in my view, holds the pole position in the investment migration industry. Malta not only has the most attractive residency by investment program in the marketplace, it also has the only available citizenship by investment program in Europe. It's a unique place where British rule of law and business ethics meets Mediterranean lifestyle and joie de vie. It's an exceptional place to work, to live, and to settle. And to tell us more about why that is, I'm very pleased to welcome our special guest today, Ryan Darmanin, a person that wears many hats at Latitude, including managing partner at Latitude Malta and the chief commercial officer at the Latitude Group. So well, welcome to the show, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me. And it's an uh, absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, for us to be here in Malta, no less. And we had a great gathering of the team yesterday and the celebration of, well, really, 10 years, Ten years that this citizenship by investment, which we're going to be talking about, largely because we have the residency programs being uh, covered in another episode. Uh, but let's focus on the MEIN, uh, which in its 10 years uh, inception was called the MIIP, the Malta Immigrant Investor Program that... Mm -hmm then became the MIN. Do you know what that stands for? Malta, Malta Exceptional Sorry. Investor Naturalization. I mean, we, there's many, many terms to it. We refer to it uh, that way, yes. which is also what um, IMI as well refer to. Yes, it. good, good, yes. good. Uh, and we all remember in its infancy, the, the, this program when it came out in 20, well, it was conceived in 13 and came out in in March, April of 2014, uh, it was highly controversial, uh, not just here in Malta, but certainly <laughs> in Europe and in Brussels in particular. Uh, and both you and I were there in its infancy and in its early beginnings. And what pleasure do we both have seeing it here, doing what it's doing and the great things that it's created and it's brought to this island uh, 10 years hence. So I really want to have um, you explain a little bit of how does this whole program work? What are the steps uh, for an applicant to get through and to be successful? Can you give us an overview sure. of that, please? So, I mean, you have... First and foremost, a fit and proper test. So we want to make sure that the prospect applicant uh, that we're speaking to is comfortable providing us all the information. It's it's a four-tier due diligence process, you know, termed as the gold standard of, of the industry. Mm -hmm. So there's no point if you're not willing to provide the necessary information, there's not even point to go through, through the process. To participate. But right. once we get through that um, initial process, then where we come in is making sure that we're going to put together, the goal is to put together a complete and correct application. And that means us having a total understanding of the affairs of the individual. And we've been told many times, not even my wife knows all that information about <laughs> us. And I say, oh, guess what? Get ready. Yes. Because that's what ensures we can get you through the process, you know, as quickly as possibly can. And, and ensures the sustainability of the program because exactly. if they didn't apply these standards, uh, these programs, as we've seen Correct. other nations nearby in Europe, Cyprus, we all know, didn't didn't uh, adhere to these kind of standards and, and has uh, self imploded. But uh, here it really is a comprehensive, you call it four tier due diligence? It's a four tier due diligence. 
and also mirrored by a four application stages. So our, you know, our focus, what we're really focusing is making sure that this one and a half year give and take is also going to be a pleasant experience for the applicant because it's one and a half years that we're going from one application on to another. You've got to have first go through the residency stage. Mm-hmm. Unless you're going to obtain residency legally, you cannot put together, you know, mountain compile an application for citizenship. So we take you through the residency and that includes the, um, uh, the client going through rigorous checks. It includes Interpol, Europol, registering with the unit. They provide their biometrics. And then come over exactly to Malta to provide their biometrics. They spend some time here. We take the opportunity to um, um, have that face time. And you know, we're dealing with very busy you know, clients. So we understand that their time is very limited. Mm. So we take the opportunity of actually um, having here, you know, having the clients here with us to you know, start working on the second application as well, which is the citizenship eligibility. That's where you're typically you know, working on the source of wealth, source of funds, business affiliations. You know, you need to make sure so that this the story f- adds up. Yeah. So it's so when you say eligibility, so it's not a formal application. It's a give us give the government's asking us for basic information. Give us all the information so that we can make a determination whether they could whether apply. you're eligible to apply for I citizenship see. or not. Interesting. Okay. Whether you're applying for okay. citizenship. Okay. And if they give that green light, then a, a formal submission is made. Correct. That would be what we what we refer to as the third application, which okay. typically is happening around you know the end of you know one year of residency. Okay. That's when it typically okay. happens. And then once they get the approval in principle, that's where the big money comes in, but also when they're later going to be invited to come and take the oath oath of allegiance and so forth. Correct. That's excellent. And I know we have uh, great little um, pie charts and and, uh, uh, flow charts to describe uh, how all this works, and your team has a great uh, uh, understanding of how to convey that to the client. Now... Listen, again, we said that these programs uh, at times were, were perceived as highly controversial because it's mm-hmm. it's citizenship against an investment, but you just describe a very important point. They first become a resident. They first create some footings on the, on the island before they bestow that privilege. Uh, how impactful would you say the old MIIP and now the current MEIN program has been to Malta, are you, would you be able to give some examples of, of good deeds that you think it's brought to to the nation and its citizens? Look, I think you know first and foremost, I would you know go ahead and say that the the citizenship program has really put Malta on the map, you know, for certain talent, for certain business people that may have not, you know, been even aware that Malta existed. Quite True. frankly, yeah. um, so the programs you know have been attracting. You know that kind of talent that Moza has not been attracting before. Okay. Which I think that in itself is you know quite an interesting an interesting story. You know, yes. a, a decade of you know high net worth individuals coming to Malta. Often and, the the top one percent of, of of segment of what they what they do and who they are right in the sectors they operate. So it's a really privileged segment of the world population that, as you say, Malta is waving a flag and saying, "Come and discover us." Um, so, so it's done that. So you're saying it's brought some exposure. It's brought some exposure, and I think with that, what has what, what I've seen in the past ten years is it has pushed, you know, Malta, the government, the policymakers, you know, the, the the service providers, you know, the 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 hospitality industry in general, you know, to raise the bar. You know, the expectations are much higher. And um, uh, I have seen, you know, that happening, you know, from from the food, from gastronomy, to, you know, hospitality, you know, to you know, marinas investment. You see, you know, beautiful yachts, you know, here in in Malta. To quite frankly, you know, commercial spaces, uh, the quality that you find nowadays mm. in, in in the commercial spaces, and whether it, that, that's directly or indirectly related, but it's been it's been, you know, um, we've taken it Tens to another level. Tangible to see. Now, I also read that during the pandemic, uh, some of the funds that were raised under this uh, this program, under the National Development Social Fund, uh, was utilized to support the, um, the well, the country and the nation and its citizens with with the funds that were raised. Is that is that correct? Correct, correct. So we've seen first and foremost a number of you know infrastructure um, 
that has utilized funds from mm. from that. We've seen, you know, charity institutions that have been supported. Mm. We have seen, you know, quite frankly, every single, you know, Sector, road, road in okay. Malta being paved, which was a joint effort between, you know, EU funds and mm -hmm. also you know, okay. the contribution. But I think, you know, the um, um, uh, the the probably best story to share would be how Malta has first and foremost during, you know, the sad time of COVID was, you know, first within any EU country to procure the vaccine. Ah. And also Interesting. Interesting. you know, um yes. in terms of vaccinating uh, its 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 population and um the, supporting uh, mm -hmm. you know with, with what's what we refer to as the, the, the wage supplement yes. during that time. Okay. So all those proceeds yes. were pretty Always much coming proceeds. from the contributions of, of the clients. Yeah, that's a very telling story. Uh, I'd listen, I'd like to remind our uh, viewers that are watching on YouTube uh, to please leave your questions in the comment section below. And for those of you uh, listening to the podcast, uh, email your queries to questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. The greatest investment you could ever make is an investment in your future. Rift Trust and Latitude Group is the leading provider of residency and citizenship solutions for high net worth individuals. Our clients are like our extended family. We're a global firm with a local focus. What makes us truly unique is our leadership team. 100 years of combined industry experience and we're working every day with governments to improve and build new residency and citizenship programs. Obtaining a second residence or citizenship is the best modern insurance policy for you and your family. Our clients expect the world. We, we deliver. deliver it. Hello, Hello to freedom. freedom. Now, Ryan, you know uh, the emphasis that we place at Latitude on a simple but memorable acronym called SMILE. Explain to our listeners and viewers how the MEIN can enhance a client's smile. Okay. I think if I may very quickly, you know, give, you know, what we, you know, refer to by, by, by smile, which is, you know, security, mobility, insurance, lifestyle, and, and, uh, and education. So I think, you know, very quickly when it comes to security, we um, emphasize on the fact that look at the program and compare it to other programs. What I like about, you know, the Malta program is that it has not changed from the time of its launch. So we see other programs going through, you know, constant change in, in the requirement changes and, and, and the contribution point, changes. Malta... It's relatively stable, other stable. than the MIP changed the MEIM, but that was... That was mostly that, in name. Exactly. That was, you know, a, a renewal of the, yeah. of the, of, of the program, you know, giving it more of a, you know, residency pathway onto, onto, onto citizenship. Um, but the second thing, you know, we have to mention that Malta as a country is one of the safest countries mm. in the world. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. One of the I safest mean, countries in the world. Yeah, you guys live a, a very safe life here, a very comfortable life. And, and you know, you, let's stick to those two last letters you mentioned, the L and, and the E, uh, L for lifestyle and E for education. Now, Ryan, you were born and bred here in Malta. So tell our listeners what makes the lifestyle here in Malta so unique and appealing. What would you point to or draw attention to? I mean, I, I, I would definitely, you know, from its stunning Mediterranean beaches, you know, the vibrant culture, you know, seen here, um, you know, historical landmarks. I mean, not many people know that we have, you know, the oldest freestanding temples in the world mm. predating the pyramids. Really? Yeah. I'm no kidding. No yeah, kidding. Egypt always wants to claim <laughs> these oldest the structures of the world, but no, they're right here in Malta. They're right here in Malta. So it's it's a relaxed, you know, pace of life. It's, it's a warm climate, very welcoming. You know, everybody speaks uh, English. Mm -hmm. So I think that definitely, you know, contributes to um, the kind of lifestyle that you know our investors are looking for. But we have to, with that, include the fact that you know they're getting the best of both worlds because the program is also opening, you know, an opportunity for them to settle anywhere in 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 Europe. Yeah. You know, quite frankly, I would say that a lot of you know clients that we could have spent more time, you know, leveraging the opportunities and the networks that they bring. 
perhaps Malta could have done a better job there. And in ah, fact, okay. other European countries have benefited from that. I see. That's an interesting point you're making. So despite with this program attracting them to your shores and, and making that very important investment, um, they obviously get to know Malta, but sometimes they wind up settling, settling nearby Europe. Uh, and that's to the benefit uh, yeah, of that recipient nation, uh, thanks to Malta having naturalized them. Very interesting point. Uh, still sticking with the lifestyle, did you know that Malta has more Michelin stars per capita than France, Italy, or Spain? <laughs> it's interesting, right? I did not know that. What's the buzz about so Malta gastronomy? There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a lot to say about that, actually. I think uh, it's fair to say that... Um, we, first of all, have a lot of talent, you know, local chefs here mm. that have been doing an amazing job. But unfortunately, Malta has not been on the on the Michelin guide. And you don't get Michelin stars that way. You got to be on the guide. But then the moment Malta got on the guide a couple of years ago, they started discovering it was like an explosion yes. of um, uh, of culinary arts, of, yes. of, of opportunities. And very quickly, Malta gained one, two, three, six Michelin restaurant, which puts Malta yes. per capita fifth in the world, fourth in Europe. No kidding! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and and you know, you brought us to a wonderful uh, dinner on uh, on Monday, a lovely restaurant in Valletta, an amazing wine, local wine, yeah, no less. A- uh, but that was an experience. I live in in London, as you know, and I would say this would rival a lot of places I've been to in London. And again, it's that confluence of that Mediterranean undertone, but also, um, you know, you got the, the Middle East and Arabic uh, influence as well, and being part of Europe, uh, the Western uh, European influences as well. So it, it brings for an interesting, um, a very interesting cuisine, I have to say. Absolutely. And, and, and allow me to say, Eric, because I quite, you know, I, I discovered this quite recently. Um, Malta is the smallest independent wine producing nation in the world. So let me say that again. Yeah. So Malta is the smallest mm-hmm. wine producing nation in the world. Wow. I mean, and, and you know, you, people didn't know that. People <laughs> wouldn't know that, you know, and this is what this whole discovery that the world is making now through the likes of this program. And as you said, it, because these programs brought uh, Malta on the map, now slowly but surely people are discovering these amazing yeah, attributes. Woof, 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 now, going back to, to the E and, and education, um, uh, you know, tell us why you think Malta's education system would be a big draw for, uh, for young families and, and their kids. <laughs> Look, for a number of reasons, Eric, uh, you know, I'll start off by, you know, to paint the picture here is if you take away UK, Ireland, Scotland and Wales, Malta is the only European country member state that has English as its official language. Mm, interesting. In fact, so much so that all subjects say for Maltese in school, is taught in English. Uh, I know, you know, for a fact, my daughter yes. was turning 10 excellent in English, working on her Maltese. Ah. I must say I'm very proud of yeah, her. Yeah, no, She's, I understand what you, you know, mean. And, thank, and thanks to the missus who's doing an excellent job with her because I haven't got the time. I'm always on the road but and English with clients. English does prevail, huh? But English prevails. Oh, okay. And that's just the nature English of the reality of the I mean, world today. Also, Malta is a hub when it comes to um, uh, English language schools as well. You know, we've had many successful you know, stories of English language schools starting in Malta and scaling up all over the world. Okay. I mean, okay. Malta attracts none less than 100,000 students per year coming from all over the world, coming okay. from Japan, from um, France, from well, Spain. I, I won't put them on the spot, but our, our <laughs> studio recorder here uh, <laughs> uh, is indeed no less from France. He was explaining to me, came here to, to learn English, but also uh, we were meeting earlier this week, uh, no less an American who's doing his law degree here. Remember that? Yeah. So it is attracting an international uh, student uh, body of people who want to uh, get educated here. And they they realize it's a great climate and safe as well, right? It's a safe place. Where, so when you factor all of that, uh, it's also cost effective compared to certainly England. Um, so, yeah, the educational system here, I think, is a big draw. 
Um, and uh, that, that's a fair point, actually, Eric. You know, we've had clients commenting that they're sending their um, uh, kids to school here that uh, they were quite surprised to see that not only did they have access to the state schools, but they also obviously had um, um, the, op the opportunity to look at private, private schools. schools yeah. And private schools are providing very good level of education for a much better price yeah. compared yeah. to back home. Yeah, I would believe that. We used to have the same argument uh, about Canada vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the United States, um, but uh, you know that, that you have more uh, more value for the money that you're investing. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go too far, I do once again want to remind our viewers on YouTube to leave their questions uh, on the comment section. And for those of you listening to the podcast, you may email your queries to questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. Now, Ryan, we talked a lot about <laughs> very positive things, and there are many uh, that both Malta and this program uh, provide, but the investment migration world has its critics, and you've seen, as I said earlier, the, you know, the first time that the benefits that these programs have brought to Malta. But you know, um, can can you tell us whether there's been some negative aspects of of Malta becoming on the map or these programs? I say these because we talked to, they were focusing on the Malta citizenship program, but you have a very attractive and, and uh, successful Malta permanent residence program that also brings its own volume of clients. Of so so it's a very you know, as a nation, is a very open uh, to the world kind of immigration policy, I, I would say here. Um, what are the challenges that you think that brings? That's an interesting question, Eric. Um, look, I think first and foremost, it's important to, to talk about the unnecessary, you know, pressure um, from the EU that this program has, has mm -hmm. brought. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that is coupled as well with, you know, unwanted spotlight led to critics, you know, both locally and mm -hmm. foreign, mm -hmm. um, at it, times quite unfairly. Yeah, what would you attribute that to? Is, is that a, just a lack of understanding what these programs are about? Lack of understanding, you know, you, you know, you see it happening in many other countries as well. You know, these are also, you know, politically um, uh, motivated, you know, driven, motivated driven, agendas, yeah. you know. And, and, and I have one comment for them. You know, people who live in glass houses, you know, should uh, never throw should. stones. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Are we perfect? No, we're not. You know, could we do better when it comes to, you know, property development? It's been given too much attention. Marta maybe losing a little bit its charm okay. because there is not a proper, proper master plan around development. Yeah, We've ne side. neglected a little bit the environment, not enough green spaces despite all the talk of that. And actually, you know, some of the contribution funds are meant to also be that. So that's, oh, I would say, okay. you know, for, you know, people listening, I that's, that's the message I would have. So, so property prices, uh, or, or have they been affected by the by the by the large demand that these two programs bring? Would you say? I I would like to think not, but I have to explain why. Because mm -hmm. if you look at if you look at the um, local you know property uh, market, it's driven by locals. I mean, you know, we have as we say when when we turn eighteen, there's two goals: get your driving license and buy property. And therefore, because despite you know the foreign investment happening in in Malta, it's still a very small percentage okay. compared to the local. So mm -hmm. I do not see prices being affected that way. But I do see Malta obviously being you know land is restricted, mm -hmm. demand continues to outweigh supply. That is fueling you know the the the, the property prices mm -hmm. and and, and mm -hmm. not not particularly the the investors. I see that the clients that we're um, entertaining and, and and assisting are looking to different kind of um, investment than what a typical you know well, family would be would be looking point. for. Yeah. So if there's pricing pressure, not necessarily on the affluent or middle market, you know these guys are coming in or these applicants are coming in at the top end of the market. So you, it's a different segment. It's a, a different market. Uh, I, I agree that it's not obvious when you really look at the data that it's affecting um, directly uh, your average home buyer here in, in Malta. I think scarcity is probably the issue uh, that we're, right. you know, it's still an island and there's still going to be some limitation in terms of supply. Uh, and then you get into, well, if you're going to build and develop, do so sensibly and environmentally friendly. So those are 
particularly important yeah. points uh, in, a, in an island nation and an island state to consider. Listen, Ryan, we're at the point in the show where we come uh, to discuss uh, anecdotes. We have this little thing <laughs> called Anecdota Time, and we invite our guests to share uh, a unique or intriguing tale, something funny, whether it's about Malta, whether it's about the industry that we're in, maybe it's something... Uh, about yourself or, or even the clients that you would have seen over the years. Uh, really over to you, Carte Blanche. <laughs> Share with us uh, something that you think the, the audience would find amusing. Okay. <laughs> um, well, actually, there's not one but two okay. stories. We have time. I mean, we, we have time. time. We have oh, time. Fantastic. So, no, one it's a family show, though, eh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, one, one story that really stuck with me um, and it had to it happens to be a client now that we're, we're quite quite close. He um, actually was one of the first that actually acquired um, um, citizenship, citizenship okay. went through the process under the new regime. <coughs> and it was at a time when um, he's from Lebanon okay. and it was at a time where they were sensing, things are about to, to, to kind of escalate. Mm. And I was explaining that this is a whole journey, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a process here, you know, there's no fast track or any of that sort. Um, and there was pressure along the way, the mm. application, because the situation in Lebanon was escalating. And deteriorating. Quickly. And I remember within days of, you know, going through the whole process, you know, um, getting the, what, what's called the letter of invitation, coming for the oath, and within a week or so after the oath, they collect the passport, the reaction on their face when they say, we may not even be returning to Lebanon. Mm. So we how mean, critical was this process they started? It stuck with me, and I said to the team, yeah. hey guys, this is how we've been doing this for 10 years, we've been working together for 10 years, and, and that's, you know, another story, but that compounds in terms of the experience that we have to be able to navigate this through. But what I said to my team is, you know, when it gets tough, remember that we are transforming, transforming. people's lives. We are. Yes. And the fact that they looked at us and was like, thank you, Ryan. With the bottom of the heart. For, yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Alessia, the team. Mm. You guys enabled us to decide where you know are next, and in fact, they spent quite a lot of time here, and here in Malta, and uh, start a new chapter. Wow. So that was that was yeah, that was incredible. Isn't that really the most empowering thing of the work that you and I do? Really, Absolutely. this is we see this time and time again. Other than you know, look, for some it's just a benefit or an advantage or a privilege, but for some it's so transformative. Now you said you had two. Yeah, unfortunately, the second story is not so transformative for the client that I was speaking to on the phone. Whereby, to cut a long story short, I was speaking to this client, and we, you know, we were navigating through uh, a few a few things, and I was like, and, and I must say, he'd been trying to to get through to me, and I was traveling, and the day that I was speaking to, I was driving, and all of a sudden, I see this guy on the side of the road and trying to draw my attention. And I'm like, I don't even know this guy. Mm -hmm. And then I look on the side and I see a car and a lady who was either critically injured or suffered a heart attack. Something must have happened. So I said to the client, sorry, I got to go. He was like, no, no, <laughs> you know, you gotta continue this conversation. I said, sorry, I have to go. I go down. From the car, I see this guy, and behind him was this lady who was delivering no. a baby. Kidding me? You gotta be kidding me! Did you witness? Did you witness? <laughs> and I witnessed on the light of day on the street, the on birth the of a child. And I was like, "What? What, what That's happened?" Amazing. He was a foreigner, oh and he was like, "Thank you for stopping." No one, Which you stop? know, no one realized what I was, you know, calling attention for because another two cars has passed. You know, and it's not easy to realize what was going on. And I was like, oh, my God, I mean, I'm not qualified for this. <laughs> <laughs> That's not in the job description. <laughs> not in the job description. I said, okay, you take care of the missus. I'll get help. Okay, good. And um, uh, did she deliver? And she, she delivered on the spot. Oh, fabulous She delivered story. on the spot. Wow, I hope the client, when you call them back, he or she <laughs> yeah, understood. Yeah, they understood. They understood. <laughs> they understood. 
Hey, listen, Ryan, you've been such a great guest. Uh, before we close out, do you have any final thoughts uh, that you'd like to share? Maybe before I open that up, opportunity to I will say in our 10 years of doing this together I'm always proud to say the amazing work you're doing here in Latitude in Malta the team that you've built is second to none the experience the depth of uh, your experience uh, over these 10 years but also the cases that you have handled the relationships that you foster with the government and the people behind Um, it's just been a marvel congratulations to you for your success uh, and we're really glad that you're leading the uh, the team here. Uh, so that's from from yours truly. Uh, but w- what would you like to say in, in terms of final thoughts, if any? Final thoughts, of course, goes to the whole team. Mm. That um, uh, there's uh, there's no way that we would be doing what we're doing without you know the the, the amazing work that the team does. You know, mm. it's like one big family. You know. Um, and uh, and I think I'd like to you know take very quickly the opportunity of sharing. You know, one particular client said to me, oh, "What is success?" We've been, you know, he's been very, very successful. He said, well, "You know, what's success without, you know, optionality? What's success mm-hmm. without actually being able, you know, to leave a legacy?" Mm-hmm. And and then that quite you know stuck with me. And nowadays, I, I I like to share with 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 you know prospective clients the fact that. If you have the financial means and you, and you are eligible, give me one good reason why not do it. Mm-hmm. One good reason why not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and and there is none except that maybe just they don't understand or know it's available, and that's what we're here to, to enlighten do. them and to share with them. Ryan, you know your stuff. You're a marvelous uh, man. I really enjoyed our chat today, Same and here. I want to thank here. you. And I'll have you back um well we won't have to wait another 10 years i promise (laughs) listeners and viewers stay tuned uh for the next episode of the global passport investor and we'll see you all shortly thanks again fantastic hey awesome that was one one take one take (laughs) for a deep dive into the recommended residency and citizenship programs available please check out latitudeworld.com for further details